Okay, hello everyone, and thank you so much for joining today's webinar. My name is Lynn Hewen, and I am the Family Services Manager for FAIR. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to pose your questions through the questions or chat feature in the toolbar on the right-hand side of your screen. I will be monitoring this, and um, I'll provide, feel free to provide me with any of your questions. Um, we'll, we'll answer some questions publicly at the end of the webinar and answer any individually that we can. Uh, the webinar is being recorded today, and it will be archived along with these slides on the FAIR website in seven to ten days. Our speaker today is Judy Miller. Judy is a registered nurse and EMT and EMS educator. She is the co-author of the 2013 publication, Customizing Anaphylaxis Guidelines for Emergency Medicine, and is a tireless advocate for ensuring that all ambulances and emergency medicine personnel are authorized to carry and administer epinephrine. So without further ado, I am pleased to welcome Judy. Thank you, Lynn. I'd like to welcome you all and start by saying thank you to FAIR for inviting me to present to you today. Over the next hour or so, we're going to explore some of the issues in epinephrine availability and administration by EMS providers, including some of the complexities of legislation, guidance documents, individual, state, and agency initiatives. We'll take a look at some of the barriers um, to providing optimal care and look at the results from a pre-hospital survey of almost 1,000 US providers. Finally, we'll look at some ways in which you yourselves can navigate what we're calling the 911 epinephrine lottery. So let's start with a scenario that's perhaps all too familiar. Your child is experiencing symptoms of severe allergic reaction. You go to grab his epinephrine from your purse and it's not there. After a brief moment of panic, you locate your cell phone instead and call 911. The dispatchers reassure you that an ambulance is on its way. At this point, everything's going to be okay, right? Well, yes, most people would hope so, and hopefully it will, but unfortunately, there's still a lottery of variables. Whether or not the arriving unit will have epinephrine on board and is staffed by personnel that can administer it will depend upon who actually responds to the call, where you live when you make the call, and the local protocols that are in place. So let's start with some background to EMS organization. Um, EMTs in this country are classified according to their level of training and certification. There are three or four um, levels of EMT. The most basic training is an EMTB. These are people who've spent about six months in training. Beyond that, we have advanced EMTs. This is now, um, we also have EMT intermediates, although these are being phased out in much of the country and people are upgrading. And then we have the highest level, which are the EMT paramedics. Much of the nation's EMS system, particularly in rural areas, rely heavily on EMTBs and basic life support ambulances. Given that anaphylaxis is a true medical emergency that occurs mainly out of the hospital, it seems reasonable to presume and to expect that all levels of EMTs could provide appropriate care for severe allergic reactions and anaphylaxis. Certainly, all EMTs are trained in the management of severe allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. How much training they will undergo is dictated to a certain extent by the national standard curriculum, which is overseen by the US Department of Transportation. Currently, as part of basic training, all EMTs are given two hours of instruction on this. And then beyond basic certification, generally local classes will be held where people are given more in-depth um, training in auto-injector utilization, recognition of anaphylaxis and severe allergic reaction, 
And again, depending upon the local agency, there may be ongoing training that happens, um, ongoing formal training that happens on a yearly basis. So we have our different levels of EMTs, the EMT basics, which we're going to call for the purposes of this webinar, BLS or basic life support. And then we have our advanced EMTs, the A's, the I's and the P's that we're going to call ALS providers. Typically, if you make a call and describe the symptoms of severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis, the dispatcher should provide you with an ALS ambulance. Typically, in many jurisdictions, you would get both an ALS and a BLS crew. However, if you don't fully recognize what's happening, if you don't use some of the magic words that, BLS, that sorry, ambulance dispatchers are trained to recognize, such as difficulty breathing, severe allergic reaction, epinephrine, you may only get a BLS crew respond, and you would have to upgrade that call when the BLS crew realize that it's beyond their capacity to manage the patient. There also may be times when an ALS unit is dispatched, but because of their proximity from the location that they've been called to, the BLS unit may arrive on scene first, and it may be some time until a more advanced life support unit arrives. Whether or not you will be successful in the 911 lottery will also, to a great extent, depend upon the individual education, training, and recognition of the provider who arrives on the unit, whether it's ALS or BLS. With apologies for this extremely busy slide, there is some interesting information here. In 2012, Ryan Jacobson and his colleagues performed a survey of um, U.S. paramedics, so these were the highest level of providers in the country. And this was a huge online survey. They got responses back from over 3,000 people. Uh, as we can see here in the first case scenario, a 27-year-old male calls EMS for difficulty breathing. On arrival, you find a moderately distressed male sitting at his desk complaining of sudden onset difficulty breathing tingling his throat, face, and hands. He states that he feels lightheaded. His vitals, they're pretty awful. He's got a very low BP. He's tachycardic. His pulse rate is high. He's breathing very rapidly. And his, he's not perfusing very well. His oxygen saturation is only 90%. And we ideally like it to be around 97 uh, to 99%. He's wheezing. His tongue's swollen. Um, he has hives. This patient is perhaps the most typical anaphylaxis patient you will ever see. I would think that every single person listening in on the call today would have recognized the symptoms and could have diagnosed this patient. So here we are with the highest level trained EMTs in the country, the paramedics. And as you can see, in response to being presented with that scenario, only 46% would have given epinephrine as first-line treatment, meaning that more than half of those patients would have been treated in a different manner, even though there's clear anaphylaxis, and this patient is, definitely needs to have first-line epinephrine administration. So that one was very obvious. The second a second question that was included in this survey, you're called to the scene of a 35-year-old patient who just got stung by a bee. So you know you have a presenting um, emergency. This patient also has severe itching, shortness of breath, her lips are swollen, she's wheezing, she has hives, but her vital signs are normal. Her airway's okay. Um, but you recognize that nevertheless, this is a severe allergic reaction in the presence of a trigger, and you decide, as a paramedic, that you're going to give the patient epinephrine. In this particular survey, almost th of the almost 3,000 respondents, close to 60% said that they would give the epinephrine subcutaneously. So although they've identified the right treatment, they're giving it via the right, the, the incorrect route, 
as you all know, the correct route of administration for epinephrine is by the intramuscular route. In this second patient scenario, even more concerning, 61% um, of the respondents incorrectly identified the site of administration. 61% um, said that they would be giving it into the arm, whereas of course it should be given into the outer aspect of the thigh. Only 11% correctly identified the site. So there's clearly a huge educational gap in the teaching of even the highest level responders. In addition to personnel issues, the 911 lottery is very much dependent upon where you live. Differences in population density, in terms of the um, environment, in funding, have resulted in huge variances from state to state. But in addition to the state to state variances, practices vary from county to county, and as we'll see a little later, even from agency to agency. So there is very little predictability in what the standard of care is going to be. This is complicated even further by the fact that various EMS systems have evolved in the United States. This is not an exclusive list, but we have many that are fire department-based agencies. We will have some pure rescue squad agencies. There are private ambulances. There's hospital-based providers. There's public services independent of hospitals and fire departments that provide EMS services. And in some areas, you'll have a combination of them all. Most of these different systems will operate according to different policies, procedures, and po protocols. To try and put this into perspective a little bit, um, we'll look at a study that was performed by the US Department of Transportation in 2008. They looked at, um, they recognized that nobody really understood what was going on with EMS, and they tried to find out, and they selected seven mid-Atlantic states, which you'll see here on the slide, Delaware, DC, Maryland, New Jersey, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. Within these seven states, we have a total of 405 different counties. All of those counties had their own policies and procedures. Within the counties, we see also a variation in the number of different EMS systems. If we look at North Carolina and Virginia, you'll see that we, there is close to 100 different EMS systems. Some, like New Jersey, don't have any different systems and they all operate under state guidance. But essentially, this very complicated slide is hopefully painting the picture that EMS provision is very complicated and that the number of different types of responses to the question, will you get epinephrine or not, is going to be complicated by the complexity of the EMS system wherever you live. As regards the rest of the, the country, that data has not yet been procured and we simply don't know what's going on. Um, the Department of Transport concluded at the end of this survey that this data is desperately needed. In 2009, Dr. Dana Wallace and her colleagues from Florida surveyed emergency medical services medical directors in all 50 states of the United States. EMS medical directors are typically emergency room doctors that oversee the provision of emergency medical services in their area. EMTs all practice under the license of their local EMS director. Even though everybody's certified, eventually it is that EMS director who makes all of the decisions and signs off on policies and protocols. So they surveyed the EMS directors as to what the practice was. They found that while all states have some level of provider that's allowed to carry epinephrine, and 31 states require its availability on ambulances, only 17 states stipulated 
that epinephrine should be provided to all EMS personnel regardless of their level of certification. More worryingly still, 19 states didn't require any level of EMS personnel to carry any epinephrine for anaphylaxis. Dr. Wallace concluded from her study that we need better education, we need more access to auto-injectors, but sadly, and perhaps most importantly for the purposes of the message for this webinar today, we need patients to recognize that they are their own protectors and must always have their auto-injectors with them at all times. And that's a sad reflection, but it's a critically important message. Given the variances and the divergencies of the EMS system, you need to take responsibility and make sure if you're aware of a food allergy, any type of severe allergy, previous history of anaphylaxis, that you never go anywhere without your epinephrine auto-injectors, and we don't rely on EMS to be able to provide it for us. This map of the United States provided by the Latex Allergy Organization actually lists here on the left the states that do require all levels of EMS personnel to carry epinephrine. Um, aside from these states, there are variances um, that there may be a state law that says epinephrine should be available, but it's allowed for individual agencies to interpret for themselves whether they will carry it or not. There are some states that don't have the, that the EMS directors do not have that luxury and their state mandated law. New York was an example of this. In 2010, a bill was passed that said all ambulances in New York State must carry epinephrine regardless of the level of provider and that all emergency responding personnel could use it. Um, they further went on to say that epinephrine auto-injectors must be on all in-service transporting ambulances. They must stock both adult and pediatric auto-injectors. Um, although for the advanced life support paramedics, they recognize that they may also carry um, ampules of epinephrine too. As I just said, um, all EMS providers will practice under the license of their EMS director. Care is delivered according to local protocols. Uh, these are written rule books for each practicing emergency medicine technician. And local protocols override any state guidance or any state legislature. Again, eventually your medical director can do whatever he wants to do because his EMTs are practicing under his license. For the EMT, even the highly experienced EMT who understands anaphylaxis, has undergone advanced training in anaphylaxis, cannot administer epinephrine, even if they recognize that the patient needs it, they may not be allowed to give it because if they were to ex exceed the scope of the practice outlined in their own protocols, they could end up going to court, they could have their certification being revoked, it will bring problems for the entire agency when EMTs exceed their scope. In most cases, scope is not exceeded because the BLS providers don't actually have access to epinephrine. For most basic life support EMTs, the furthest they can go is to assist the patient in administering their own epinephrine. I'm sure most of you will agree if you've recognized that the this is anaphylaxis and that you need epinephrine, the best thing to do is give that epinephrine before the EMT arrives. Taking this down to a really local level, and again with apologies for those of you tuning in from the rest of the country, um, we are here today in Northern Virginia. This map here represents a small part of Northern Virginia, and uh, there are a number of neighboring counties. This is in, within a very small radius. And if you look at the EMS protocols for these neighboring counties, we can see huge differences. 
So as we can see here in Arlington, only ALS providers can admit, carry and administer epinephrine. Neighboring Arlington in Fairfax City, again, it's ALS, and they can give for moderate and severe reactions. Across the border in Fairfax County, rather than the city, they can only give in severe reactions. In Lord Fairfax, again, very close by, BLS and ALS may carry and administer epinephrine, and the differences go on. It's conceivable that whether or not you receive epinephrine literally depends on which side of the street you are standing when that ambulance arrives. In addition to the jurisdictional issues, there's other factors that complicate anaphylaxis, severe allergic reaction, and epinephrine administration. In 2012, we performed a nationwide online survey of pre-hospital providers. Almost 1,000 responses were received, and this was the first time we had gone out to a mixed population of EMTs. So there were all level of providers included, asking them a number of questions um, on this topic. The first question was, do you have protocols? Do your protocols actually define what anaphylaxis is? And as you will see here, about a quarter of people had no definition of anaphylaxis. This is clearly one of the starting problems. If people don't know what anaphylaxis is, then they don't know how to treat it or the point at which epinephrine should be administered. As you can see here, there were 967 people who answered this question. And I'm not going to take you through all 967 responses, but I can tell you there pretty much were 967 different responses. This is the first 15 of them. And as you will see, anaphylaxis is defined in many different ways, from facial angioedema into respiratory difficulties, into a low blood pressure, um, different answers from different people. This is not unique to EMS. This is a problem across the entire field of severe allergy and anaphylaxis in that it's very difficult to get two doctors to agree what is anaphylaxis. We know very clearly that there are differences in how an allergist defines anaphylaxis from how an emergency medicine physician defines anaphylaxis. This is why it's really important that you utilize the anaphylaxis action plan that's been given to you by your doctor. Utilize an anaphylaxis action plan such as the one provided on the FAIR website. So you become the expert in what is anaphylaxis and at what point should epinephrine be given because your healthcare professional can't decide amongst themselves. We looked at a number of other issues um, and very consistent with Dr. Wallace's results. When we asked, do your protocols permit BLS providers to administer or help the patient to administer their own epinephrine? About 50% of BLS providers could administer, about half of the country could not. And even amongst those who said yes, they could administer epinephrine um, as a basic provider. 15% of them needed to have medical control authorization. So even though they have a protocol, even though they have the epinephrine, they're still, they're still one phone call away from being allowed to administer it. We also looked at how epinephrine was supplied on basic life support ambulances. Um, it was encouraging to see that where it was supplied, about 75% of it was provided in the form of auto injectors, both pediatric and adult. However, about one third was supplied as ampules of epinephrine, where at that point, the provider has to be familiar with the dose 
the differences between pediatric and adult dosing, and of course there is a potential for error. I think one of the most alarming points of this survey um, was this question, what percentage of the patients that you run with severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis have no prior history of allergy? And to break this slide down, we'll see that about 35% of patients had never had a previous allergic reaction and therefore would not have had their own epinephrine for that BLS provider to administer. We believe that this data provides one of the most compelling reasons to initiate change. It's one thing to say a BLS provider can help a patient with their own epinephrine, but if 35% of patients don't have their own epinephrine and don't recognize what's happening to them, this is a large number of patients potentially at risk of a life-threatening situation. And even amongst the patients who, are, who have previously had a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis and have epinephrine, a large percentage of them have not self-administered epinephrine prior to the arrival of emergency medical services. We probably need to look further into this in subsequent surveys. We didn't break it down, although there have been other there's been other research to suggest that either patients aren't carrying their own epinephrine, they are carrying, but they are not administering, either because they don't understand the right time to administer, some may be needle phobic. We've heard people saying that they try to delay using their own epinephrine for cost reasons and that they don't want to have to go to the ER and refill their epinephrine, that they prefer to use something that was essentially free of charge from the ambulance. But there's a lot of patients who are not giving epinephrine um, prior to EMS arrival. This is consistent with other studies, including the recent um, Anaphylaxis in America survey. This paper that was published um, at the end of last year showed that at the time of anaphylaxis, only 10% of patients called 911 and only 11% of patients administered epinephrine. So clearly, there's an education gap amongst the patient community themselves, which again means that the healthcare professionals are not doing an adequate job in explaining the need to give early epinephrine. Equally, or perhaps more concerning, um, was the answer to this question on allergy triggers. We asked um, the pre-hospital providers, are there particular patient populations you're more likely to give epinephrine to? And as you can see here, we had people who said, yes, we will give it more frequently to somebody who's had an insect sting, or more frequently to a child, or more frequently to a teenager. There's no scientific evidence to support preferential administration of epinephrine to a particular patient demographic or to a patient allergy trigger. Regardless of the trigger, regardless of the patient's age, these patients should have, be get, should have been getting um, epinephrine. Other studies have shown that maybe food allergies are a higher trigger for um, for epinephrine administration, our study didn't actually show that. We've looked at a lot of the reasons why um, there are problems with the EMS system, why you may not get epinephrine. This is all the more surprising because back in 2011, the National Association of Emergency Medicine Physicians, based on all of the available data, met and put out a position statement. In this position statement, they agreed that epinephrine is the cornerstone of treatment for potentially life-threatening anaphylaxis. 
they said there are many reasons why EMS agencies um, should allow all providers to carry and administer epinephrine. And they further went on to recommend that all emergency medical responders should be allowed to carry and administer epinephrine auto-injectors to their patients. Now we're in 2014, and as we see, that recommendation has not been implemented by more than half of the country. So until such change occurs, and we can fix this highly complex situation, what can you do as a concerned member of the community, as a patient with severe allergy, as a caregiver for somebody with severe allergy? There's a number of easy steps, and these are endorsed by FAIR. The first thing to do would be to call or visit your local ambulance provider, whether that's based at the hospital, whether that's based at a fire department, and find out what the exact policies are in your area. Ask them what type of EMT will respond to a severe allergy call. Do all of your units stock and carry epinephrine? Are all of your providers allowed to administer it? And how long, on average, does it take for your providers to respond to a call? By preparing yourself with this sort of knowledge, you will have a better understanding of what to expect during that terrible moment when you have to make the call. And you can base your own treatment decisions upon the answers you receive. Unfortunately, being upset with the answer you receive won't change the practice immediately, but it would allow you perhaps to make that decision that you're going to give that epinephrine earlier, that you're going to drive yourself or your child to the hospital, that you stipulate very, very clearly um, that you need advanced life support because, as we know, all life, advanced life support providers carry epinephrine. In addition, it's important to have an anaphylaxis action plan. Take a preemptive strike and try and avoid triggers. Recognize the signs and symptoms. Make sure you know when you should be giving epinephrine and make sure all of the providers, uh, all of your carers, the people around you, family and friends, also know when they should be given epinephrine. Enable your child's caregivers to give epinephrine first. Let them know that it's okay to give it. They don't have to call you first to check. Give it first and then you can discuss it afterwards. Make sure you're carrying your epinephrine. Make sure this is in date. Sign up for an epinephrine auto-injector expiration service. If you have your epinephrine with you, give it before you call 911. Make sure you get an ALS ambulance. And finally, if as a result of today's webinar, you are left feeling that there are more questions than answers, if you feel that there are more problems than solutions, you're probably right. Um, change is needed. Everybody has a role to play in making change. Maybe that starts with you contacting your own state legislature. Um, maybe there's other ways in which we can work together to elicit change. And we'll be hearing more about that in just a moment. In the meantime, um, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm going to turn it back over to Lynn, who has been compiling the questions. I have, and you can continue um, trying to plug in any questions, and we will try to get to them. Um, so uh, the first question that, that kind of came through was related to EMT training on epinephrine being counterproductive to emergency action plans. Um, in that they are sometimes given instructions that they should only administer um, epinephrine when a patient is unable to breathe or unconscious. And so their question was related to at what point will EMT training converge with the current best practices for emergency use of epinephrine? 
That's a great question. Um, I'm not so sure that there is a simple answer to this. Um, there is not, although there is a national curriculum mandated by the Department of Transport, the actual use of epinephrine in auto injectors and when to give it, as we have seen, devolves down to an agency by agency basis. As we saw looking at the map of Northern Virginia, some protocols permit um, giving it only in severe cases. In the agency in which I work, we recently underwent a change and we are now authorized to give epinephrine in mild, moderate and severe disease. As we know that there are no contraindications um, to the use of epinephrine in anaphylaxis and it's felt that it's better to give early. But the, tr the training is a portion that needs to be addressed. The actual application of the training is something that has to be addressed at a local and a national level so people can get to the point of best practices. Okay. Um, one other question that came up was related to your map of the different systems um, with the different protocols. And she was based out in California, but I think that this would apply to all local jurisdictions, is um, how, they, how they find out that information um, and be able to develop a similar map for their own uh, local jurisdictions on policies and permissions. That, that's, that's an excellent point. And, you know, it's, it's going to be a huge job. And it is something that there are a number of people looking at at the moment. I'm not certain um, personally how many counties there are in California. I don't know all of the nuances of the California EMS system. Um, it's a huge state. It's much bigger than Virginia. We saw the complexity of almost 160 different counties and systems in Virginia. I can only imagine it's more complex in California. And there isn't a simple point of contact to pick up the phone and say, what are you doing? Um, there's not also, not all EMS agencies publish online their treatment protocols. The agency I work for, it is a publicly accessible document. Anybody could go online and find out um, what EM EMTs are allowed to do in Prince William County. However, we are probably one of five, about 5% 5 of EMS agencies that do this. So in answer to your question, how do we go about doing this in California? It's going to, it would be long painstaking work of finding out every single EMS agency and literally at this point having to call one by one and verify what their policies and procedures are. It's, there would be, there's obviously in each state, there's a state EMS office, they will tell you what the state guidance is, but as previously mentioned, it devolves down to each individual agency. So it's, it's a lot of work. Um, that's not to say that work doesn't need to be done, but it's not for the faint-hearted. I think we'd all like to see a change at a much higher level so we didn't have to worry about what an individual agency does and that we just eliminate the problem by implementing those recommendations from the National Association of EMS Physicians. Okay. Um, another question that came through was asking if there is an educational model for education and training that you prefer, promote, or know of. Um, and just as an aside, we also do have uh, FAIR's Vice President of Advocacy, uh, George Dahlman, in here uh, to help address some of the things that I guess, you know, FAIR is doing <laughs> from an educational standpoint as well. But, I mean, are there any educational programs that, that you recommend? Oh, that's a, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, there is no standardized program um, for EMS providers other than the curriculum put out by the, de the Department of Transport, which is, which is basic. Um, I'm certainly not familiar with the thousands of different EMS systems and the type of training programs they've put together. I would like to think um, that a training program that I've helped to develop in Northern Virginia sets very high standards. I'm not certain 
I can't speak to today to say whether that could be shared with others, but it's certainly something I'm prepared to look into. Um, we've actually just updated our training for 2014 um, to include better recognition of anaphylaxis, to include information on the new types of auto-injectors, and to include better determination of when epinephrine should be given. And the bottom line that we are now educating our providers is if you even consider, should I be giving epinephrine, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, one other sort of question or, or more of a concern that kind of came through, and I, I guess if you could address if this is more of a, um, if what you would recommend, what steps you would recommend her taking uh, in, a, in a sort of unsettling EMS experience where she had where the, the ambulance was not equipped to handle a toddler um, when her son was having a reaction, and she also, uh, they did not have food allergy friendly options when he was actually in the ER. Would this be sort of more of a one-off thing, or what would you recommend that she do in order to kind of take proactive action to prevent that from happening again? With huge apologies that this happened on behalf of my fellow professionals, um, I think the best thing to do in the case of individual incidents where you are concerned about care is probably to start by going back to the agency that provided that care, whether it is the local fire department and asking to speak to the rescue chief, the, the boss of EMS, to the local office of EMS. Um, complaints can be filed through them, complaints or concerns. And these concerns are taken extremely seriously and will be investigated and measures can be put in place to try and prevent that from happening again. And that's really the only way in which EMS services can be improved is by noting those concerns. Okay. Um, one other question that came through about um, one of the areas of pushback for, I guess, epinephrine administration is the cost of auto-injectors and had inquired if there are any cost-saving programs available for EMS that you might be aware of. Currently, I'm not aware of cost-saving programs for EMS. I, I believe that all of the manufacturers of epinephrine auto-injectors are prepared to enter into discussion with any entity that wants to make large purchases. Um, and again, I'm not, I'm not aware of such programs. From the point of view of, from a medical legal point of view, and I know that a lot of emergency departments have looked at this, given the potential for error in dosage, in giving by the wrong route of administration into the wrong site of administration, um, when you are using vials and syringes and therefore the potential for litigation, uh, many ERs have now come to the conclusion that it is cost effective to provide an epinephrine auto injector to prevent the potential litigation um, from the wrong drug being administered at the wrong dose and the wrong concentration. This is slightly outside the scope of this particular call, but there are two main uses of epinephrine. One is for the patient experiencing severe allergy and anaphylaxis. The other is in cardiac arrest when somebody has a heart attack. All ambulances, um, all ALS ambulances will carry two different forms of epinephrine. They will have the epinephrine one in 10,000 concentration for use in a heart attack, which is given intravenously. They will carry epinephrine one in 1,000 concentration, which is for intramuscular injection. Nearly all of the adverse effects and severe adverse effects and epinephrine associated deaths that have ever been reported are due to administration of the wrong drug. This is now recognized and again has been a very strong driver for people to switch to epinephrine auto injectors. Um, and another question that just came through was um, how can we make a difference on a national or a state level and who do they contact in order to encourage better protocols to come down from a higher level? This may be George. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. Just so everybody knows, this obviously Judy has laid out that this is a very complex issue, and this is not an issue that lends itself 
to, uh, for example, uh, a bill in a, in a state legislature or anything, certainly at the national level. Um, so FAIR has decided that, that as a community we needed to get a better handle on how to address this. So we are convening um, a meeting of many of the stakeholders in this space, uh, many of the professional organizations as well as people like Judy um, and industry and patient uh, advocates to try to figure out how to approach this. As, as Judy mentioned, that there are several different layers and complexities to this, and it devolves down to all sorts of local levels. Um, and, and what may be the best approach? It may typically, in, in the space I work in, we would usually address it legislatively. That may not be the case uh, in this instance. It may be something that's more educational that goes through um, national associations or state associations. Um, so we're trying to get a better handle on that, and I think once we do that, uh, certainly part of that will be um, an avenue for individuals to get engaged with it. And I think Judy laid some of that out in trying to communicate with your local EMS um, and, and get an understanding of what their protocols are uh, from the state all the way down to the county or local level. So hopefully we'll have that opportunity for everybody to take part uh, after we have this session and sort it all out. I think that that wraps it up as far as our, our questions go. Um, let me just pick one. Um, so with that, I would like to just let everybody know about our next webinar, um, which is managing food allergies in the early care setting. I know that this is a really important topic for a lot of um, a lot of moms and, and parents that are getting ready to enroll their kids in school. Um, this is taking place Wednesday, July 9th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Member registration uh, will open as a priority for our members on Friday, June 6th, and then open registration will begin on Monday, June 16th. We have two really wonderful speakers on the topic, Laurel Franker um, and Gina Mennett Lee are both going to be our expert presenters on this topic, so um, we expect it to be pretty very well attended, so make sure that you register early. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, definitely feel free to contact us here, and we will be happy to address any offline questions um, the best that we can as well. So uh, thank you once again for joining us, and we hope to see you next month for our next webinar. Thanks again, Judy, and thank you all for being here today. <laughs>